Hi, I'm Hans Edstein, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois in the Department of Animal Sciences. I would like to talk to you today about different methodologies that are used to valuing the quality of feed ingredients fed to pigs. This is the second presentation in this series. In the first presentation, we talked about the first area of nutrition which includes what we feed to the animals, and that is related to the nutrient composition of ingredients. In this second part of the presentations, I'll talk about what happens in the gastrointestinal tract of the pigs after we have fed the ingredient. And what happens here includes digestion of the feed, absorption of the nutrients, and excretion of excesses. So we'll take a look at each of these three different areas and talk about what happens when we feed our ingredients to the pigs. When we talk about determining digestibility values of nutrients fed to pigs, we have a general equation that we can use. And this equation can be used to calculate the digestibility value on a percentage basis of nutrients or energy that are included in ingredients we feed to the pigs. This is a pretty simple equation. We simply subtract the output of that nutrient from the intake and then we divide by the intake and multiply by 100 to get it on a percentage basis. So as an example, if we feed 10 grams of a nutrient and we collect 2 grams of that nutrient in the fecal output, then the digestibility of the nutrient in this ingredient would be 10 minus 2 divided by 10 multiplied by 100, and that will give you 80%. We call this the digestibility value of 80%, or if we don't multiply by 100, then we call it a digestibility coefficient, and that would be 0 0.80. And we use this equation to calculate digestibility of nutrients and energy in all ingredients. However, when we collect the output of the nutrient or energy from these ingredients that we fed to the pigs, we have to realize that the output contains the undigested feed nutrients and also some nutrients that were of endogenous origin. And these endogenous nutrients, they are nutrients that were absorbed from the intestinal tract by the animal, but then they are incorporated into enzymes or other compounds that are secreted back into the intestinal tract of the animal. That means that when we collect the output in the feces or other places, then the nutrients we find in the feces contain a combination of the endogenous nutrients and the undigested feed nutrients. And this will influence the digestibility values that we calculate. As an example here, we can see that if we feed different levels of a nutrient to pigs, then we get different digestibility values. In this example, we are feeding 3, 5.3, 7.7, or 9.7% of lipids in diets fed to pigs. And the lipids in this case are coming from corn oil, and we can see that the more corn oil we include in the diet, the greater is the digestibility that we calculate. And this is because in this case, we calculate the digestibility the same way as I showed in the equation to begin with, where we subtract the output from the input, and then we get what we call apparent total tract digestibility of lipids. And the reason the apparent total tract digestibility of these lipids increase the more of the lipids we include in the diet is that the output we collect, in this case the feces, contains more endogenous lipids if we have a low inclusion rate than if we have a higher inclusion rate of lipids. So at the low inclusion rate, we get a greater proportion of the total output as endogenous lipids, and that results in a calculated value for the apparent total tract digestibility that is relatively low. However, as we increase the inclusion rate of lipids in the diets, we get a relatively smaller contribution of the endogenous output to the total output, and therefore our digestibility values that we calculate increase. We can correct for the endogenous losses if we can find a way of determining the total endogenous losses. And in this case, we have determined the total endogenous losses and subtracted those endogenous losses out of the equation, and then we calculate what's called true total tract digestibility of the lipids 
and we can see here that now we don't have an influence of the inclusion rate on total tract digestibility values. So by correcting for the endogenous output of the nutrients, we can get a better estimate of the digestibility of that nutrients. And in particular, we don't get this increase in digestibility as we increase the inclusion rate of the nutrient. And therefore, these values for true total tract digestibility are more accurate than values for the apparent total tract digestibility. We can also sometimes determine what we call basal endogenous losses and correct the digestibility values for these basal endogenous losses. And if that's the case, then we do not determine true digestibility of lipids. We only determine the standardized digestibility of the lipids or other nutrients. So if we look at different procedures we have to measure the digestibility of energy or nutrients, we basically work with two different procedures. We either have the total tract digestibility procedure or we have the ileal digestibility procedure. And the total tract digestibility procedure involves placing a pig in a metabolism cage, and this metabolism cage will allow us to collect all the fecal material that is excreted from the pig because we have a screen under the slatted floor in the cage. We also have a urine pan sitting under the screen so we can collect all the urine that is excreted from these pigs. And that means we know what the pig is eating and we know what the pig is excreted in the feces. And by subtracting the amount of nutrients excreted in the feces, we can calculate the total tract digestibility value of these ingredients. If we're working with energy, we will subtract both what's excreted in the feces and what's excreted in the urine from the intake of energy of the pig, and that allows us to calculate what we call the metabolizable energy value of energy. The second procedure we have is what we call the ileal digestibility procedure, and in this case, we have to insert a cannula at the end of the distal ileum of these pigs, and that allows us to determine how great a proportion of the ingested nutrients were absorbed in the small intestine. And we use this procedure for nutrients where there is a significant fermentation or degradation or synthesis of nutrients in the hindgut of the pig. And in this case, the fecal or total tract digestibility will not give us a good measure of the digestibility of this nutrient. But if we can get access to the ileal fluids, then we can determine the ileal digestibility, which for some nutrients is more accurate than the total tract digestibility. To gain access to the ileal fluids, we have to surgically insert a T cannula into the distal ileum. And on the picture to the left here, we are show, showing a pretty commonly used T cannula that we use for growing pigs. And you can see the dimensions here. And the cannula is produced from stainless steel and we then put on a plastic washer to keep it in place towards the body wall of the pig and we have a cap we can put on when we don't collect digester. And when we collect the digester, we simply remove the cap and then we can put a little bag on the cannula and th that allows us to collect the ileal fluids. And we use different sizes of cannulas depending on the size of the pig so we can actually can cannulate pigs that are only 10 to 15 days old, we can cannulate growing pigs, and we can cannulate sows. It only depends on how big a cannula we are using. And you can see the cannula is sticking out of the side of the pig, and by opening the cap of this cannula, we can directly collect the ileal fluids of the pig. That means we can calculate the ileal digestibility of nutrients. And we use this technique to calculate digestibility of different nutrients and in particular of amino acids. In four amino acids, we have shown many times that the most accurate way of determining digestibility of amino acids in pigs is to determine the standardized ileal digestibility of amino acids. So that means we need to have access to the ileal output of the amino acids and we also need to determine the basal endogenous losses of amino acids, then we can calculate the apparent ileal digestibility of amino acids, correct these values for the basal endogenous losses, and by doing that, 
we calculate the standardized ileal digestibility of amino acids. It's very well documented that this procedure is the most accurate procedure to determine the digestibility of amino acids in different feed ingredients, and for that reason, we usually measure the standardized ileal digestibility of amino acids in any feed ingredient that we use in diets fed to pigs. If we look at other nutrients, we first start with phosphorus. For phosphorus, we have a situation that's a little bit different than for amino acids because for phosphorus, there's no difference between the apparent ileal digestibility and the apparent total tract digestibility. And in this case, we have the apparent ileal digestibility values in the red bars and we have total tract digestibility values in blue bars. And we have three different ingredients here, corn, low phytate corn, and soybean meal. And we can see for each of these three ingredients, there's absolutely no difference between the ileal digestibility and total tract digestibility. And therefore, we usually determine the apparent total tract digestibility because then we don't have to insert the cannulas into the pigs. So for phosphorus, we don't usually determine ileal digestibility, we usually determine total tract digestibility. We saw before with lipids that the values we calculated for the apparent digestibility was influenced by the level of lipids in the diet. We can look at the same thing for phosphorus. In this case, we have three different types of whey powders that we fed to pigs. One source was a conventional whey powder that contained 95.8% dry matter and 0.63% phosphorus. We also looked at whey permeate, contained 97.7% dry matter and 0.57% phosphorus. And finally, we had a low as permeate that contained 98.4% dry matter and 0.10% phosphorus. We determined the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in these three ingredients, and we can see here that the whey powder and the conventional permeate had the same digestibility, but the low ash permeate had a much lower digestibility of phosphorus. However, these were the apparent total tract digestibility values, and as we've seen before, if we correct these values for the basal endogenous losses, then we can calculate values for the standardized total tract digestibility. So we did that in this example. So what we have on this slide is not only the apparent total tract digestibility values in orange, as we saw before. In this case, we also have the standardized total tract digestibility values. And remember, the standardized total tract digestibility values are calculated from the apparent total tract digestibility values by correcting the apparent total tract digestibility values for the basal endogenous losses. And we see here that while there was a difference in the apparent total tract digestibility among the three ingredients, when we correct for endogenous losses, there's no longer a difference among the three ingredients. We have just about 90% digestibility of phosphorus in all three ingredients. So what this tells us is that the reason for the low apparent total tract digestibility in the low ash permeate simply was that there was so little phosphorus in this ingredient that the endogenous losses contributed a larger proportion of the total output and therefore we calculated a, do a low value for apparent total tract digestibility. And this clearly shows us that values for the standardized total tract digestibility are more accurate than values for the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus. So the conclusion on phosphorus is that diets fed to pigs should be formulated based on values for the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus and not based on values for the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus because, as we just saw in the previous slide, values for the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus are much more accurate than values for the apparent total tract digestibility. Let's talk a little bit more about lipids. As was the case with phosphorus, the first thing we have to decide is whether to use values for apparent ileal digestibility or values for apparent total tract digestibility of lipids. So here are data from an experiment in which we used two different sources of lipids. One, we had diets that were fortified with extracted lipids, which is simply corn oil, liquid corn oil that we added to the diet. And we have another set of diets 
where we used intact corn oil. That means these lipids were not extracted. They were simply included in corn germ, and then we added more and more corn germ to get more and more lipids into the diets. And if we look at the digestibility of these two different sources of lipids, we can clearly see that the extracted lipid sources, they have a greater digestibility than the intact lipid sources. So that is the first conclusion here. We can also see that for the extracted lipid sources, there are no differences between ileal digestibility and total tract digestibility. And ileal digestibility is illustrated here in the red bars and total tract digestibility in the yellow bars. So for extracted fat, there's no difference between ileal and total tract digestibility. However, when we look at intact fat, we can see that the values for apparent total tract digestibility are less than the values for apparent ileal digestibility. We believe that the reason for this reduced digestibility is that when we added the intact lipids to the diet, we added increasing level of corn germ, and the more corn germ we add, the more fiber we also add, and fiber serves as a source of nutrients for the microbes in the hindgut, and the microbes can then synthesize fat, so we actually got microbial fat excreted into the feces of these pigs. So when we calculated the total tract digestibility of fat, we had not only the undigested feed lipids that were present in the feces, we also had lipids that were synthesized by the microbes. And that is the reason we got a reduced digestibility when we looked at the apparent total tract digestibility compared with the apparent ileal digestibility. This problem is clearly illustrated on the next slide where we have calculated the endogenous losses of fat both at the end of the ileum and over the total tract. The ileal endogenous losses here are illustrated in the blue bars, whereas the total tract endogenous losses are illustrated in the orange bars. And we can see that for the extracted fat, there's no difference between the ileal and the total tract endogenous losses. And that is the reason, as we saw on the previous slide, that there's no difference between the apparent ileal digestibility and the apparent total tract digestibility of fat. However, when we look at the intact fat, we can see that the ileal endogenous loss is greater for the intact fat compared with the extracted fat. We can also see that the total tract endogenous loss is much greater than the ileal endogenous loss. And that means that we get a lower value for apparent digestibility calculated, which is exactly what we saw on the previous slide. So the reason for that lower digestibility over the total tract compared with at the end of the ileum is simply that we have an increased endogenous loss over the total tract. To avoid the contaminating factors of these microbial lipids that are synthesized in the hindgut of the pig and therefore increases the endogenous loss, it is more accurate to calculate the digestibility of lipids at the end of the ileum than over the total tract. And for that reason, we should determine lipid digestibility as either true ileal digestibility or standardized ileal digestibility of the lipids. And we therefore need to have cannulated pigs exactly the same way as we had cannulated pigs when we worked with amino acid digestibility. The last group of nutrients I want to talk about today is the carbohydrates. And we have different types of carbohydrates in our diets. The entire fraction of carbohydrates consists of monosaccharides, disaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. And the polysaccharides can be divided into starch and into non-starch polysaccharides, which is also called NSP and lignin. And we can see three of the groups of carbohydrates here are highlighted in light blue. And the reason for that is that these nutrients are absorbed mainly in the small intestine of the pig. So to get an accurate estimate of the digestibility of these nutrients, we need to use the ileal digestibility of the nutrients rather than the total tract digestibility of these nutrients. So again, we have to work with cannulated pigs and determine the output of the nutrients at the end of the ileum. And the reason for that is illustrated on this slide where we have measured starch digestibility in field peas. In this case, we had four different types of field peas. The red bars illustrate 
the raw field peas that had not been heat treated. We had some field peas that had been extruded at a temperature of 75 degrees Celsius. They are in the yellow bars. We have another group of field peas that had been extruded at 115 degrees Celsius. They are in blue bars. And finally, the last batch of field peas were extruded at 155 degrees Celsius. Those are the green bars. And we measured both the ileal digestibility and the total tract digestibility. And we can see here that the ileal digestibility was less than 90% for the raw field peas. But as we heated the field peas, we increased the ileal digestibility up to about 95%. So there was a linear increase in digestibility as we heat treated the field peas, and there were differences among the four groups. However, when we looked at total tract digestibility, we can see that there's no difference among the four batches of field peas. They are all digested by about 99%, which means that if we determine the total tract digestibility, we are not able to pick up the differences that exist among these ingredients. So this illustrates that if we want an accurate estimate of starch digestibility in field peas, we need to determine the ileal digestibility rather than the total tract digestibility. When it comes to the non-starch polysaccharides and oligosaccharides, this is a fraction that we also call fiber. And those fibers are not digested by enzymes in the small intestine the same way as the starch was. These fibers are fermented in the large intestine by the microbes, and then the pigs can absorb volatile fatty acids that can contribute energy to the animal. To illustrate that, we have determined the digestibility of fiber in distillers dried grains with solubles, also called DDDS. And in this case, we had total dietary fiber, which are the blue bars. We had the soluble dietary fiber, which are the yellow bars. And we had insoluble dietary fiber, which are the red bars. And we determined both the ileal and the total tract fermentation of these fibers. And we can see that the ileal disappearance or fermentation of fiber is relatively low, but the total tract fermentation is much greater, which illustrates that the microbes are mainly present in the hindgut of the pig, and therefore we get more fermentation in the hindgut. In this case, we can also see that the soluble dietary fiber are very well fermented by pigs, whereas the insoluble dietary fibers are poorly digested by less than 40% overall. So for this particular ingredient, we can see that the overall digestibility of the total dietary fiber is less than 50% because DDDS contains more insoluble dietary fiber than soluble dietary fiber. But these data also illustrate that if we can increase the solubility of our fibers, then our pigs can increase the utilization of the fibers because they can ferment soluble dietary fiber much better than insoluble dietary fiber. And the difference between digesting carbohydrates in the small intestine and fermenting carbohydrates in the large intestine is mainly caused by different energy values that the pig can get from absorbing glucose in the small intestine and volatile fatty acids in the large intestine. And we can see that for glucose, a pig can utilize about 1.46 kilocalories per gram of glucose that is absorbed, whereas for volatile fatty acids, the pigs can utilize only 1.02 kilocalories per gram. So what this illustrates is that the pig is more efficient in utilizing energy that is absorbed in the form of glucose compared with utilizing energy that is absorbed in the form of volatile fatty acids. So we would prefer to have as much as possible digested in the small intestine and absorbed in the form of glucose compared with absorption of volatile fatty acids in the hindgut. So to conclude on the energy from fiber, what we need to do is to determine the concentration of total dietary fiber in the feed ingredient that has to be in percents or in grams per kilogram. We then measure the apparent total tract digestibility of total dietary fiber on a percentage basis. And then we can multiply those two values and calculate the quantities of digested total dietary fiber 
in grams per kilogram. And from there, we can calculate the total amount of kilocalories that the pig can utilize from fiber by multiplying the total grams of digested dietary fiber by 1.02 kilocalories per gram. That will tell us the total amount of energy that the pig can utilize from digesting and fermenting fiber. So in summary, on carbohydrates, we have seen that sugars are absorbed in the small intestine and they are assumed to be 100% digestible. We usually don't determine digestibility of sugars because they are so easily absorbed. Starch digestibility needs to be measured as ileal digestibility. So in this case, we need to work with cannulated pigs, as we have seen, and fiber is determined as apparent total tract digestibility of fiber, and we can calculate the energy value of fiber as 1.02 kilocalories per gram. So these are the different procedures that we use to determine the digestibility of carbohydrates, and therefore we also determine the energy value of carbohydrates in our feed ingredients. So this concludes this part of the presentation. We've talked about the digestibility of amino acids, of phosphorus, of lipids, and carbohydrates. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in more information about feed ingredients, you can visit our website that is found at nutrition.ansite.illinois.edu. Thank you very much.